Welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hello there. Welcome to 1% Better, episode 151, which is the second last episode of the season. Last week, I think I said that as well, but I mean it this time. This is a, effectively a best parts of season three review, something I've been thinking about for the last while. So I decided to put together just a few clips from some of the interviews that was put out, were put out during the season three that's wrapping up. And I decided when I was narrowing it down, it was very difficult to pick just a few. And to be truthful, as I went through the episodes and was running through all the insights and ideas that came out of it, I said, no, I have to maybe do this over two little episodes and pick maybe five for each. And that's what I've done. I have the five for this week and five for next week. And I hope they will be interesting for you to listen to. If you've listened to the episode already, you might get a reminder when you hear the the little segments. Uh, If you haven't, it might whet your appetite to go back and listen to that full episode. And hopefully it is useful for you. Last week's episode was with Mel Parker, leadership expert, ex-military ranger, airborne ranger. And some feedback on that was interesting. People were very relatable to Mel and thought the episode flowed very well. He's a really good talker. What I found interesting was his love for his grandmother, but also how she had a strong control over him or a strong influence on him more than anyone else in his life. And a few people got in touch talking and touched on that, which was interesting. And anyone who's had a grandmother that has had a big influence on their life will probably relate or a grandparent perhaps. I certainly did. And I really enjoyed that interview with Mel and uh, I would have Absolutely encourage you to check it out if you haven't. Episode 150, Mel Parker. He has a book called The Parker Principles, all about his leadership lessons learned, force multipliers, and it's a really good listen. So check that one out. So to wrap up this season, this episode has five clips, and the five I will just introduce, and you can hear a little bit from each of those as well. As I said, it was a difficult task to narrow it down to 10 clips from 10 of the 50 plus episodes and in many ways it was random Uh, so many really good interviews over the year and took a lot from them Uh, so it was very difficult so I said I'd just go with five this week five next week and anyone that was a guest that listens to the show and didn't make the top 10 that is not any indication of you not being a great guest trust me They were all very, very good, and I'm very proud and happy to have been involved in recording all of them. But there can only be a few, and here here we go with the uh, the first five. So episode one in the best bits of 2019, or season three, was with Ma Anand Sheila, and this actually was episode 100, big number, but it was one of the biggest guests I suppose I had last season or this season. And if you've ever seen the episodes of Wild Wild Country, a Netflix documentary, you will know all about Man and Sheila. I remember at the time when I posted some tweets just before recording with Man and Sheila, I think I got in the millions of retweets and reaches because she's a well-known character and very divisive in a way if you saw the episode saw the interviews with her on wild wild country on netflix you'll know what i mean this was back in the 1980s there was a commune created in the u.s and she was the secretary was her title to a bagwan sri ranj niche later known as osho and she played a very pivotal prominent role in that commune and wasn't always very well portrayed. Her, her her ways and motivations came across very interestingly during the show and also during the interview. She actually served time in prison and that was something that we touched on in the chat as well. I'm very excited when I got uh, able to talk with her. One of the biggest 
pain points from that interview was the recording sound quality. Um, Sheila has her own home, I guess, in, in uh, I think it's in Austria or Switzerland, where she looks after uh, patients with dementia. And she was talking into a laptop at the time, and it was a difficult one. I did a lot of work to try and get the sound edited properly and improved. But the clip you'll hear, hopefully, is one you'll still be able to take something from. And it was about her time in prison and what was the key lessons she took from that time in jail for some of the crimes that she committed during the communal time in her life with uh, Osho and the many other uh, Rajneeshis that were living there at the time. Again, if you haven't seen the documentary, definitely check it out. Six episodes, I think very much worth the watch and if you hadn't listened to the podcast hopefully this little clip will give you an insight into Sheila and her time in prison and what she takes from that and the values that came from it and yeah there you go that was a big one man and Sheila so here's the clip <laughs> a student of life I think um, I, I, you know again lots of stuff that was in the documentary I don't want to go over all ground obviously I know you, you did your time you served time in, in prison I don't want to and I know you have no regrets right that's that's clear and that's a, a good way to certainly to live what was the, the things you learned most about you when you were in prison was there, were there things that you maybe learned that you didn't know about yourself beforehand I didn't know that I had so much patience. Mm-hmm. And prison taught me immense amount of patience, which is now is the biggest asset in my work. Because working with handicapped people, sure. you require patience. I did not know the value of time that I learned in time. We all talk about time on a daily basis. We say, I don't have time. I don't have time. Or, oh my God, there's no time to get it done or so. But the actual tangible time, the feeling of time, I learned in prison. Because in prison, you're only doing time. Okay, so clip number two is with an Irish gentleman. His name is Sir Steve Timothy, or Steve-O Timothy. And he is a comedian, and he's from Galway. And I interviewed him in episode 125. Found, discovered Steve-O this year. Probably had seen some of his work before this year. But it was an interesting story. Somebody on... Twitter had retweeted a post Steve-O put up about wanting to maybe get involved in his own podcast and they had connected me with him and I rang him and we had a chat about how to potentially go about that but I invited him to be a guest on the show as well and we were able to make that happen not so long afterwards we had a call that went down very well. We talked about his life, his ups and downs of which There's been a few and he has struggles with anxiety, dealing with trolls online, disability. He's in a wheelchair. The love he has for Everton or Everton football club, as he calls it. We touch on creativity, business, his similarities to Conor McGregor. And and of course, we talk about him and his partner, Sinead best known as Farmer Michael and Kathleen. He's been on tour for the last year and a bit, uh, random tour and random events across different locations, but doing really well, selling out 500 seats in some venues in, in the UK and doing really well in Ireland. Millions and millions of views on YouTube. The Farmer Michael sketches in his car are hilarious. Some of them are really risque, maybe is a a right word, wrong word, but certainly controversial and provocative. I know during the Rugby World Cup, he got publicity in Tokyo and Japan for some of the stuff he was putting together. And everybody has a 
Farmer Michael, I think, in Ireland in some part of their family or something like it. And uh, it was very uh, a very funny conversation in some parts and a very serious one in others. So we talked to the clip I'll share is about the pride he takes out of his work. Uh, Steve-O, does he take pride in that? And does he consider himself to be an entrepreneur? Have a listen to this clip. And if you're interested in hearing the full episode, the link is in the show notes, episode 125 with Sir Steve-O Timothy. Would you consider yourself a businessman now, uh, like an entrepreneur in a way? Uh, Jesus, I don't know. People have called me that, but I'd say more of a chancer. (laughs) Self-deprecating anyway, but but like you are... Well, that's that's what I am. That's what I do. My whole thing is kind of pulling the piss out of myself, I suppose. I, I'm never, pride will never be my, my downfall anyway, that's for sure. Like, I, if anything, I find it hard to be proud of certain things and find it hard to be proud of what I do. But now and again, I do. But I suppose it's just, it's a character flaw or maybe a, a powerful character trait. I don't know. But I suppose. Like, we like to do things ourselves. A lot of what we do, we've always done it ourselves. There's never been a middleman. We've never had this person do this for us or things like that. Mainly because I'm a bit of a workaholic and a bit of a control freak, so I wouldn't trust people to have that done. You know, I'd be on to Sinead, like, did you answer that email? And she'd go, no. And I'd be like, for fuck's sake, why didn't you answer that? You know, it's kind of like, so I'd nearly take on everything myself just to not have someone not reply late or reply late you know so but like obviously we're kind of hoping to step back a bit next year so we've MPI artists they're an Irish based agency and they're going to organise our tour for 2020 so that takes a lot of a lot of stress off us I suppose like so clip number three of the best bits part one of season three is with relationship expert Susan Winter. This was episode 101, uh, so early on in season three. I think we recorded it, if memory serves, around Valentine's Day, uh, fitting that it was around relationships. But Susan has amassed decades of experience giving people advice on their relationships. She will be considered a guru and a thought leader in this very changing space, as she says herself. She's been a guest on Oprah Winfrey, and that has uh, certainly at the time put her into the mainstream media, and ever since she's stayed there, she's published books, best-selling author, a book called Allowing Magnificence, and another one called Older Women, Younger Men. She specializes in evolutionary forms of loving partnerships and higher thinking, and we remember talking to her about number of different topics. One about setting goals in your relationship, getting very goal focused in what you both want from it. She's had over 10 million views on YouTube at the time when we recorded. So that's probably a lot more since. Puts lots of informative videos out there, has podcasts out there as well. And uh, yeah, I was delighted to chat with her. We talked about a number of different terms and topics in the world of relationship, like breadcrumbing, catfishing, and ghosting, something, uh, ghosting is one that I was certainly heard of before and uh, probably experienced as well. But this one with Susan has lots to offer if you're anyway interested in relationships, learning how to maybe be better in your relationships. And in the little segment that I included from the episode, we talk about fate and determinism. I asked Susan, does she believe in fate? And her answer brought in fate and determinism and how it all ties to relationships. It was a really interesting one, guys. As you can tell, I probably um, waxing quite lyrical about this one. And I'm looking forward to talking to Susan again in season four. Lots more to cover there. If you have interesting questions around relationships, drop me an email and I can pop them into that uh, next one with Susan. Anyway, here's a little clip from the interview with Susan. Enjoy. Do you believe in fate? Fate. Mm-hmm. You know, I um, very. That's a very interesting question. Yes and no. So I thought years ago that I had to decide which camp I was in: fate or determinism, right? And I thought, okay, and I would weigh them. Like some work sometime, some works the other time, and I've decided I believe in both. At the same time, with the, I'm going to qualify this. <laughs> My personal philosophy is that there is 
a preferred template for us. There's a blueprint that um, has been handed to us in our life birth with all the circumstances and the setup and that there is a preferred outcome or several preferred outcomes, but that at each juncture along the way, it is our decision whether we continue or we deviate. And sometimes the deviation is taking us to where we want to go. So that's self-determination. And yet I think there is an ultimate fate that could be uh, for us, but it is, but, but I still think self self will has a lot to do with what that fate is. Hmm. So I, I didn't think you, I thought you had to pick one or the other and I finally decided I can't. So I'm going to choose both of them. Okay. Then next one up is a topic that I'm passionate about that I love doing on a nightly basis. And that is sleep. What were you thinking? Sleep is the topic, and the guest was Marty Varghese. Always have trouble pronouncing Marty's second name there, Varghese. Uh, his interview was episode 114, link again with the notes. And I kind of hunted Marty down. The topic of sleep was something I wanted to share with listeners and personally learn more about. And I think this is the one where I probably asked the most questions because I had so many I suppose, unknowns around sleep that I wanted to get answers to and in a conversation way, because sometimes you're reading stuff, you mightn't take it all in. And Marty delivered, absolutely. He answered them like bang, 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 bullet, bullet after bullet uh, answer, and it was uh, really interesting. Marty is um, a sleep expert, as I said. He's a senior respiratory and sleep expert physiologist in St. James's Hospital in Ireland, in Dublin, since 2003. And we learn during the episode about how he got into this whole area. At the time of kind of diving in, it wasn't that big of a thing, this whole sleep expert skill set was was still developing. But he really has dived in and, and made it his own and has such a, an amazing amount of knowledge to share. During the episode, we talk about so much his passion for sleep, and then the different types of sleep diagnoses or challenges, sleep apnea, insomnia, just to mention two, and how he can use tools like cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT to help people get a better night's sleep or day's sleep if they sleep during the day. Well, some people do. We talk about medicine and we talk about exercise and all of those other things. And in this little clip that I shall share, Marty talks about dispelling some of those most common myths around sleep. And I think it will be of interest to you. Take it away, Marty. What are the most common myths you hear around sleep? I suppose when you're you know, clients coming in, is there things that you hear that are just not true? Uh, uh, that, that, that's a very interesting question. A lot of people would have a tendency to compensate for their lost sleep. Mm. You know, and that, that is one of the problems that is perpetuating insomnia for them. So, um, oh. so somebody who is sleeping poorly for two or three nights, and when they, I mean, you can't really fault them for doing it because, you know, you sleep two or th- you have poor sleep for two or three nights and then, then you get a good night's sleep and mostly on a Friday night because they don't have to worry about going back to work the next day. And they tend to sleep in long hours then. Mm. For instance, if they if they're sleeping until 10, 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., um, like some people do. But then when they wake up, they don't have enough time um, to build up their sleep drive for the next night's sleep. Mm. So when they go to bed on Saturday night, you know, there isn't enough appetite for sleep built up and they find it difficult to fall asleep and then get into a vicious circle. Mm. Very interesting. It just triggered something for me there when I sometimes travel at work. I would fly to the US and then maybe coming back on a a Friday or Thursday night as somebody that's probably tall enough that I can't sleep on a plane, I'd be awake most of the night. Would it then be advisable i'd often try and get a, go to bed for a few hours during the day but then wake up groggy afterwards and find it difficult again to to get back into it so is there approaches to to kind yeah. of I, yes I, th- I think those are personal circumstances where you have to kind of you know uh, catch up with the lost sleep to a certain extent 
Um, but also at the same time to make sure that we would have enough wake hours before we go to bed at night. And it would be very similar for people who have to commute long distance to get to work on a daily basis. And they will end up not getting enough sleep during the weekdays. And last but not least in this part one roundup of the best bits that I could pick out, uh, we have Susan Bennett. So who is Susan Bennett? I hear you wonder and ask yourself. Susan Bennett is an American voiceover artist, and she came to prominence a few years ago as she was the female voice of the very first version of Apple's Siri, the service that was introduced with iPhone 4S, I think it was, based on my notes here. And that might sound like, oh, that's interesting. But as a result of becoming that voice and that well-known voice, she has had a huge explosion in her popularity and became a celebrity as a result. She's been on the Letterman show in the US. And as a result of this, it really propelled her into an environment, into a world, into the limelight that she wasn't necessarily prepared for or something she never really harbored in the years and decades beforehand as a voiceover artist. She's definitely done lots of work, but it was very much a new experience for her as she came out, uh, quote unquote there, air quotes, as Siri. And she really had to get comfortable with that quite quickly. She shares her whole story before Siri and life after Siri. We talk about being an introvert and her acting career, her singing, her musical career as well, which she has very much uh, done very well in as well. But in the little clip I share here, that uh, I think you'll enjoy. And I think you will enjoy this episode as well if you do check it out. It's 107. She talks about that struggle, I suppose, that internal dialogue that was going on when Surrey became very popular and famous. Was she ready to come out as Surrey? Did she want to make it known who she was? Because, again, being an introvert and dealing with all this newfound fame was going to be challenging. So listen to her learning from that and check out the full episode because there's lots more good stuff in there as well. So over the 30 or so plus years you've been doing it, you've you've had a lot of successful jobs, I guess, you on commercials. And for a number of years you were, you were happily doing that, but probably without any celebrity, quote unquote. Would that be fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Um, And that's one of the things I liked about it. It's the reason that it took me two years to reveal myself as the voice of Siri, because I really wasn't sure uh, what to make of the, I wasn't sure how much of a fame aspect there was going to be. And that fame is nothing that I had ever wanted or had aspired to. And so that was a a big concern for me. I didn't want my privacy invaded. I, I didn't really know how to deal with the fact that I was the voice of Siri. It was a a great life lesson for me. Um, I had to learn things about myself and I had to um, put myself in a position of doing things that were scary or things that I wasn't really sure of things. And uh, so that's why it was a a fabulous life lesson for me. And one of the big lessons I learned is that you've just got to take some risks now and then if you're going to grow and if you're going to learn more about yourself or, or give yourself more options, you've just got to put yourself out there a bit. So there you go, the first five interesting best bits from season three that I could randomly select, and hopefully you found some of those interesting. As I reflect on season three myself, lots of learnings taken from it, certain kind of highlights. Recently, one point that jumps out at me, and I've always struggled with this, you might believe it or not, but as the podcast took off and as I started to get more social aware and push it out through social more it's always been really difficult to post regularly tweet about the episodes over and over have that internal battle going on of like you're kind of pissing people off by doing this but one interesting thing i took from a guest recently was he defined social media as a very fast running stream so that when you do post something somebody might see it or or your followers might see it But very quickly, it'll have gone through their timeline and they're going to miss it. So that was one reflection I've had recently about coming overcoming that kind of battle of posting too much or not posting enough. At the end of the day, the only way people will hear this stuff is by sharing it and trying to do that uh, in a 
friendly way, but not overly um, holding back on it either because you have to kind of do that frequently. And that, that's something that maybe if you're doing something similar, you, you struggle with, oh, the fear of posting something, the fear of putting your thoughts out there. Um, just know that only a few people will probably see it at that point in time as well. And you have to do it a few times for it to take traction. And I've noticed over the last few months as I kind of done a bit more and use automation to do tweets and things like that, um, which is an eye opener if you have never heard of automation for tweets and posting on different platforms. It, it's a game changer. You can do it without actually being on front of the screen or on your phone. That helps. Uh, once you start doing it, that's where traction comes and you have to push it like anything. You have to advertise your content. And a lot of times the people I talk with in coaching, if they're setting up their own business or doing creative type work like this, it's a struggle. But at the end of the day, you got to get your message out there. If you're passionate about it and you believe in it, go for it. Don't hold, hold back too much. So uh, thanks for listening to this one. Always good to have you along. Hopefully there's something in it for you. And the biggest benefit I can get out of all of this is if you subscribe to the show on whatever platform, mainly Apple, because that's the one where it has charts, even though they're uh, not the most reliable, but it's good when they're high up there. As I always say, you'll, other people will find it. So subscribe there, share it with a friend, sign up to the newsletter, and let me know if you liked this one. And next week we'll have the final part uh, of season three wrap up best bits and some good clips to come there as well okay have a great day have a great night weekend whatever it is or whenever it is you hear this and we will be back again next week thanks and good luck